Hello? Do you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, I feel like in Star Wars with this thing here, but uh, I'll try to speak up uh, a little bit and um, a bit slowly, um, so everything should be fine. My name is uh, Mitko Mitev. Um, originally I'm Bulgarian, but I live in the Netherlands for the last uh, 17 years because um, I decided that, uh, you know, testing is international thing, so I can travel around and uh, see some other culture and um, uh, get some experience in the region and in the area of software testing and quality. Uh, today's presentation uh, will be about uh, how good is your testing um, and I'll try to give you some signs or some uh, points for thinking, uh, food for thought. Um, so it's more about discussion than actually teaching you how to do stuff. So um, how do we know testing is good uh, enough or is it enough? It's a very frequently asked question. Um, there is always problems that we see in the newspapers, lots of fiascos, companies uh, uh, experiencing uh, bad public relations, uh, you know, and l lack of uh, reputation. Um, so people have to make sure um, at least the minimum quality is in place before they go live. So for me, my personal opinion is that um, assuring um, the minimum quality is a must. Um, so, as a manager, you need to analyze and, if needed, you need to invest uh, resources and time and money in, in your software testing. And, of course, there is a big difference between not enough and not good enough. So, um, this is also about um, discussion about uh, how we make it better. So, let me give you some numbers. <clears throat> According to Cambridge University um, Business School, in uh, 2015, uh, company lost $312 billion just because of um, bad software, debugging on production. Can you imagine? $312 billion for debugging. And another $60 billion for bug fixing. $60 billion for bug fixing after production. So, this is just waste of money, yeah? And not only that, um, companies that experience failures on production, they, um, you know, their shares, their stock drop by 4%. That's uh, another research from Parasoft. And if you have repeatable failures on production, um, it, go, it goes even more. It goes like already 6%. So, um, you are uh, losing a lot of money, not only directly investing in debugging and fixing bugs on production, but also because of lack of reputation, people don't believe in your software anymore. So much. So the capitalization of this 6% is another $3 billion. So your company is losing a lot of money for bad quality of software. Um, I don't know about you, but this is a huge amount of money for me. So how can we help not to lose so much money for debugging and bug fixing after we go live? I, you know, for people who have um, been on my presentations before, they know that I love to give examples of bad stories. It's like I call them fiascos or horror stories. So this is one for you. And it was not that long ago. It was, I think, uh, four years ago. So there was this company, very well um, positioned on the market and very well known. Um, but they produced a very bad software, piece of software, a trading algorithm. And this algorithm caused 440 million loss in 45 minutes. When they went on production, for 45 minutes, they generated so much wrong deals, so much uh, damage, that uh, it actually accounted three times more than the money that they made, their annual earnings. So this is kind of um, $10, million, $10 million a minute. 
just because of bad software. The shock was total, and um, the company lost uh, more than 75% of their um, capitalization. The, sh the stock went rapidly down. Eventually, they ran out of market, but they were bought by another company just to save them in the end. And this is just an example. I have another one, Infinium, for you. They, um, s they managed to stop the algorithm. It's, it was a pretty similar story. They managed to stop the algorithm in three seconds. I don't even know how they do that. I mean, in three seconds. But for three seconds, they generated one million loss, just for three seconds. This is kind of a 20 million a minute loss. So you see, it's, um, you know, sometimes you say, if you're a manager, you say, ah, quality is not that important, but it depends on the software that you're developing. If you, um, if you develop software that um, takes care of people's lives or people's money, then it's, or people's health, you know, then it's very important to have a good quality of software. So I'm sure most of you have heard this before, Managers saying, well, we produce software without bugs. Um, so it's, it's like common misunderstanding on um, some concepts about testing, that text, testing is very expensive. It is an expense, but everything is expensive software development. So, but what is your alternative? Do you have an alternative? How are you going to solve a problem with the quality? And in, in general, testing is preventive by nature. The idea is that um, it's not about finding bugs only. We're trying to make the software better in so many other ways um, and uh, not to have those kind of disasters when you go on production. And of course, um, late, um, in the later years, um, we have some other concepts, uh, misconcepts, uh, like uh, we don't need testers at all. We do DevOps. It's another buzzword. And we do Agile. Uh, all right, DevOps. I had a conversation with a manager from Amazon um, three months ago, and he said, you know, look at Microsoft. They don't have QAs anymore. Really? Okay. And we do the same. Uh, we do DevOps. We go DevOps. We, um, we got rid of uh, the QAs in Amazon. Right. So who's doing the testing now? Oh, developers. So how do you call them? Well, test developers. Uh-huh. So what's the difference? I mean, just the title? Okay, I mean, you have to do testing. You can say, well, we don't have QAs. You can call them test developers. You can call them, I don't know, whatever. But, you know, you have to take care of quality. You know, you have to take care of testing. It has to be done. And don't forget, um, test, testers and developers are totally different skill set. And to totally different, sometimes, mindset. So, um, yeah. You cannot really say, let's get rid of the QAs, and uh, we'll do everything with uh, developers and DevOps. And on top of that common misconcepts on the market, we see that the budget for, um, for software testing goes up. If you look at the, this is the report from World Quality Report for last year, uh, it's going to be 40%. From 18, just for five years, we go from 18 up to 40. So who says testing is going to die? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. 40%. It's like heaven for testers. We have a lot of money now. So that's the whole thing. Um, people see um, the budgets in general in, in the world for testing goes up. But how is your company doing? So that's what I want to talk about. Um, how is your testing? Is it good? Is it bad? How do you know your testing is good? So you have few defects discovered. So you think you're here. Uh, this is software quality against testing quality. Yeah? But maybe you're not. Maybe you're there. Maybe your test, testing is not good as well as the software. You know? Both of them have bad quality. So how do you really say we're doing a good job here? I'll give you some signs, like 10. I can give you probably 
20, but, you know, I have only 30 minutes to talk, and I'm afraid with this lady with the signs that, you know, I have only 15 minutes left. So, um, we have something called glitches. That's a very trendy word for big disastrous defects on production. Yeah, glitch. Um, yeah, obviously, if you have issues on production, that have to tell you that you probably don't do enough testing. Yeah? So you have two types of um, issues or defects on production. One is unknown, that you don't even know that it exists. Uh, and the other one is known by the management, but it's accepted to be released with these issues. Yeah? So the unknown is um, a bit worrying because how come you haven't discovered them? You know, how long have them been there? How how many iterations or cycles you've missed them, and why? You know, um, why is not discovered earlier? Maybe it's not only about um, investing more time and more money. Maybe you have to change your whole strategy of testing. If you're missing a big amount of uh, bucks on production, that's probably also a testing process problem. And the known, why? Who decided that uh, we are going live with issues in production, in the software? And how many times are you gonna say, let's go with these issues again and again? Do you have a plan to fix them? I mean, it's good that you have some deadlines to keep, but uh, you know, quality is also very important. And then, if some of these issues are found by customers, that's even worse. Because, um, you know, um, customer coming back to you and saying your software is not good enough and it, it doesn't do the job that we expect to do, that cannot be good for you and for your reputation. Um, can also have disastrous effects. I, I, as I told you about night capital, uh, people can lose a lot of money or even worse, somebody can die, you know. so. Um, and of course, the production bugs are the most expensive ones to fix. So, yeah, you have to anal analyze why is this happening on production. The second, um, the second sign that something's wrong with your testing is uh, you're finding a lot of bugs in acceptance testing. You guys doing acceptance testing? Yeah? And maybe some companies that are smaller and do small applications for mobile, maybe they don't need acceptance testing. It's a question of choice. But acceptance testing is not about finding bugs. It's too late. It's about building confidence about the quality of your product, about your product. And uh, acceptance testing is like Confirmation that the software does what it has supposed to do, like intended uh, design and uh, comparing to requirements from the business side. It's not about finding bugs. So if you keep finding bugs in acceptance testing, that means your previous testing is not good enough. So you have to really reconsider and invest more on that side. Third one is um, your bug counts. So the bug counts, you, um, you probably use defect uh, tracking software. It's pretty easy to analyze the statistics of this software. They give you any kind of statistics. Question is if you actually use some metrics uh, in your companies. If the bug counts go up, you really have to analyze immediately what's going on. Um, and you have to take measures because your software can go into the so-called death spiral. So basically, the bug count is going rapidly up and it never goes down and, and it's, it ends up in a disastrous situation that you may even cancel your project because of the bad quality. Um, but not many companies use um, metrics. And why? They're so um, easy to implement and doesn't really cost anything, it's just uh, some calculations that can give you a trend, and it's very good to analyze those trends. You can see if it goes up, if it goes down. So I'll give you some example about metrics. 
I'm not an expert in metrics, but we, we implement metrics just to see what, what's going on. Um, metrics you can have on, on different levels. You can have on a project level, you can have on a department level, you can even have on a company level metrics. Um, here is an example about coverage, requirements and requirements coverage, you know, um, how many are covered against the total, or, for example, defects found before and total defects before and after delivery. So this, you can say how good your testing is. I mean, if, the, if this is a small percentage, then it means that a lot of bugs are going on production, which is not good. Yeah? This is on project level. I can give you an example on department level. So-called MTDs. Uh, I, I know there are some experts here about metrics, but uh, and MTRs. Basically, these are the issues defected against the execution time and the issue uh, fixed against coding time. So these are kind of metrics that you can use to see how quickly you find problems in the quality assurance team, in the testing team, and how quickly these problems have been addressed. So you can see if it takes more and more time for fixing. Maybe the software is very complicated. Maybe the integration is difficult. So yeah, but at least you can see the trend and you can act on it. On the company level, um, just an example. Um, how many defects are found by customers against the total number of defects? If this is uh, big and if it's growing, then you really, really have to think about uh, your quality. This one is not very um, interesting from your point of view, but you can say, um, I'm not investing enough just by comparing with other companies around you, you can say, okay, this company, my neighbor, they are similar size and they have a similar product and they invest much more in testing. We should probably consider investing more, more time and more money and more resources as well. Another sign of not good enough testing. If you, if you know what is good, then you, you, then you know if you're doing a good job or not. So defining what is good enough is important for everybody. Then we can talk about, like, you usually put these things in your master test plan or test plan, and you say, okay, I want this percentage of coverage, let's say 95 or 90 or 85, Maybe the others are not so important. And then I want a percentage of execution of my test cases. I say 100% executed, maybe not all succeeded, but 100% executed. And why the rest uh, have not succeeded? Um, traceability matrix between execution and um, pass-fail criteria together with the defects. And some acceptable level of defects. We can say, for me, good enough is fix all the majors, have a, a certain amount of minors, but I have a plan how to fix them later on. Um, so you don't have your known effects going up the count. And so on and so on. You, oh, 10 minutes, man. Uh, OK, I'll speed up. Number six, listen to your testers. Yeah? I, I talk about lose-lose situation. Uh, it's not win-win, it's lose-lose. So testers in a bit difficult situation sometimes, if they say no, they're blamed for delays of you know, deliveries. If they say yes, product goes live with bad quality and uh, you know, they're still blamed. So you're blamed anyway. But if you have good testers and they talk to you, listen to them. It's really important. Um, and they raise legitimate issues, and then um, some of these issues have to be addressed before you go live. Now, we talk about testing so far, but there are other things that can be done outside the actual testing execution, preparation execution, that also can improve your testing, let's say. One of them is prevention, and uh, defect prevention. So, there are things that you can implement in your organization that can help you with prevention 
uh, of defects. One of them is um, having your testing team helping you with the requirements assessments, you know, um, talking about uh, implicit requirements, make them explicit, and so on and so on. Another thing is that you implement coding standards and best, best practices, good practices. And something that is really interesting and very not so much implemented is reviews or inspections, but more foremost. And this is um, static testing technique. It helps a lot. Uh, um, and it's uh, in the beginning of the process, so it's basically not that expensive. Yeah? So prevention is important. People say, this is an analyzing uh, report from IBM, that preventing bugs save money. Finding bugs earlier is four to five times cheaper than finding bugs later. Uh, in the process of software development. Number eight, um, get, your t um, get your developers involved in the process. I don't know, maybe all of you have unit testing implemented. Maybe um, your developers are doing this just um, all the time. It's a good practice and it's cheap. It's also cheap. People think, hey, they invest too much time in developing unit tests. Maybe they can do some coding instead. Well, it, um, finding bugs early is cheap. So get them to do unit testing for you. Because it's very natural to developers. It's much better to write unit testing to somebody that is um, developing the code and implementing unit tests is quick. So what's the picture so far? We talked about known and unknown defects. We talked about defect prevention. We talked about unit testing. And we are here, independent test effort. So our test process and test documents and everything can be perfect. But it's not only us on the picture. Yeah? It's a system. It's a, it's a team effort. And you see these points? These are decision, decision points. And here as well, if you have defects, are you going live with them or not? So as a manager, you have to really make some decisions and uh, improve your testing um, to have a good quality on production. So I have two more left for you. Have you seen this? So yeah, we can, uh, we can do good, cheap, and fast, but you can choose only two. I imagine most of the managers will go for a cheap, fast option. First is less money, and then you go to production quicker. But we are most concerned about the good option. So time problems. How many of you have seen this picture before and experienced it? You know, you have so much promised time for testing, and at the end, you end up with this person. Like, I call this test shrink, yeah? Always. How many? Everybody? Yes, yes. good. So why? I say if it's very uh, often that it happens, you have some serious issues, not only in your testing team, but in your whole organization. And you have to, have to address probably process, process uh, issues that you have. And you have to really analyze it, and you have to make sure there is enough time for testing. It's not about only adding uh, resources, like, OK, we had, one, let's say, one week, and now we have two days. So let's double the team. Let's make it you know, from five people. Let's make it 15 or triple. It doesn't work like this. So you really have to plan better. And I know estimation is not easy, especially in the beginning. But it comes with practice. Yeah. You have to make sure you have enough time for testing. And the last one, and I say it's the most crucial one, people leave your company. So testers keep quitting. This is the ultimate sign. Something's totally wrong in your organization. If people leave, sometimes it can be about money. They want bigger salaries, you know. 
But most of the time, is that because they're not happy. And why are they not happy? It's probably also professional reasons. Maybe it's too much pressure. Maybe it's too much, uh, too, not enough time for testing. Maybe it's, uh, you know, it's too small team and you give them too much to do. Frustration levels are growing and eventually people start leaving. So this is an ultimate sign that your testing is not good enough and you have to reconsider. And more than that, happy people have much better performance. If you keep your testers happy, they will do the world for you, you know. That's it. And if you think it's enough, you still can do some improvements. Um, how about using testing as a tool for high-level risk management? Yeah, you can do that. How about looking at the usability of your test, uh, you know, test materials and test uh, um, artifacts? You can do that as well. How about automation? Let's automate. Only if you have good, uh, good process of testing. Otherwise, automating mess is a mess, you know, so <laughs> don't do that. Yes. Um, yeah, lots of challenges. That's my last slide. Oh, I still have five minutes. Okay. Um, yeah. But these are some of the most important that I think, especially bad quality on production. I consider this as unacceptable as a test manager. And I will never, you know, agree on some political discussions and stuff that we compromise with quality. Um, but of course, we have uh, other challenges uh, in your process. It's like more coverage. Uh, I talked about the time, time problem, lack of resources, yeah, you know, sometimes you can't find enough good people on the market, especially in the years like this, when everybody wants a good tester in his team, it's not, uh, it's not that easy, but um, yeah, we have to deal with this uh, all the time. Thank you. That was my uh, presentation. Okay, it's questions, times. I'm, I'm uh, Mike from Kyiv. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, most of the people here met the situation when there is not enough time for testing. So uh, could you please provide a practical example? It's interesting to hear from you your experience, like one or two examples. Hmm. How, how did you perceive this situation? Thank you. Right. Hmm. <laughs> so, um, having a project with uh, tight deadlines um, is not new. And it happens. Um, the question is if it happens on a regular basis. So it's not, a, it's, it's not a bad thing to make a mistake once, but if you make this mistake every time, then, you know, I, as usually we say, um, smart people do mistakes, but only stupid people repeat them. So, you know, you have to find a way to do um, better planning. And with Agile, you know, I guess some of you guys are doing Agile a software development lifecycle. Uh, you have retrospectives and you have uh, different techniques to plan better. Estimation is always a challenge because, uh, you know, when you start uh, estimating in the beginning, it's a pretty abstract thing, but uh, with the experience, you know, you start planning better. There is no ultimate decision on this problem. Obviously, you have a scope creep sometimes during the process. Requirements change, features change, so you have to adjust, but, um, yeah. It's a uh, it's tricky, tricky thing, and it's uh, mainly on experience. What I sometimes do, uh, I say, okay, um, in the beginning, your task is, let's say, five days. The maximum time that you can add extra is five days. So then you, you go on the next day, you already have four days. And uh, the maximum time is four days. So it's like a, a process that uh, you cannot uh, go too much too late in, in the time. Um, that's the technique that I use from time to time, especially for testing. But in general, uh, you know, planning is a team effort, and uh, yeah, you have to do it together. Okay. 
Uh, hello, uh, Alexander Gubriev, Smart Bear Software. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, I think uh, I want to ask about uh, opposite thing uh, when testing is not enough, but maybe you can answer uh, when testing is uh, exceeded. So uh, we spent maybe a too lot of money or resources for testing. Um, you mean when it's more than enough? Yeah, maybe uh, you have answer for this because yeah, okay. uh, sometimes our managers said that yeah, I think uh, it's too enough. Uh, maybe our, our competitors have uh, spent uh, less resources for this. Okay, so, right. Thanks. Um, that's why I said on one of my slides. I think one is number five criteria. So as a test manager, if I have my exit criteria in my plan and I reach them, it's no point of testing anymore. So why should I go even further? That's actually too much spending money for no reason because we already reached our exit criteria. Yeah? It's a question of setting the right exit criteria. I mean, in some ind industries, uh, testing budgets are 300% on the development budget. Like, for example, uh, aerospace uh, uh, business. It's like uh, European Space Agency, they have 300% testing budget on the development budget. Like three times more money for testing because you don't want to launch a rocket and then it uh, explodes just for one buck, you know. Uh, and this is like five billion dollars. So if you have the right criteria, you should not be doing exceeded testing. And uh, if those criteria are agreed with the management, then it should be fine. So, for example, if you, uh, sorry. Uh, for example, if you achieve these criteria um, too quickly, you can, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, limit the time, make a shorter period of testing, or how we can shorten uh, yeah, you I understand. Well, um, you can constantly review your criteria. If you think it's too much, then the next project will be changed. You know, if you say, okay, um, you know, we could have done better. Maybe the level of, of coverage is too low. Next time, instead of 80%, we're going to do 90. It's fine. And if it's agreed with the management that they want to invest money in this and they see the reason and they see the added value, then it's okay. So, yeah. But it's really it's like a contract between your team and the management. If they're happy with this criteria, you should be okay. Yeah. Any uh, yeah. questions? Uh, my name is Yuri Mali. I'm from Odessa, Ukraine. Uh, I just wanted to add small, maybe answer, maybe variant of answer to a previous question about shifted dates. When uh, we have shifted dates in development, usually we have a lot of overtimes in QA team. Yeah. How we solve it? We plan overtime risk buffer for development team and for QA separately. So mm -hmm. when developers cannot fit the day, they start overtiming. And only after that, QA team can start over time. It slightly uh, decrease the load for QA team. Okay. Because usually all overtime came to QA. Mm. In that approach, developer was were a little more uh, responsible. Responsible. Yep. Yeah. Make them pay, you know? <laughs> yeah. Not only you do your overtime, they do overtime as well. Stay together in the office. Uh, is there one question? Hi, my name is Lena. I'm from Hi. Moscow. Um, you tell us a lot of bad stories, uh, but maybe you have a good one about a uh, great company and dream team uh, that uh, no, mm, no problems with testing and so on, and uh, how they um, come to it. Good stories. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, you know, eventually, if I look at my experience, all the projects ended up successfully. Well, a lot of pain, a lot of overtime <laughs> sometimes, but eventually, happy customers, you know, so 
it's not all doom and gloom. It's, it's you know, it's a process of, um, um, it's, it's like a, a journey to happiness, you know. Um, when you look at the, I've been in many companies and doing projects, some of them very big, some of them big names on the market. And when you go to software development, it's always the same story. From outside, it looks perfect. Inside, if you see inside, it doesn't really look so, so well. But um, it's a question of motivation to keep improving things. Obviously, not everything is perfect. But step by step, if you can make this better and that better and put some structure and put some order in the things, and you have commitment from management, eventually things uh, start going better. Maybe not perfect, but much better, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you for your answers. Uh, I'm Mike, uh, Dell EMC, St. Petersburg. I have an interesting question about what do you think uh, about overlapping cycles of development and testing. For example, if development of some parts of the project is finished, but others are out of time, and you start testing the, that mm. parts that are finished and then integrated in the whole. Right. Well, we have different types of testing. It depends what types of testing you're talking about. But um, uh, yeah, it's a question of uh, how your team is uh, structured and set up. It's, uh, well, sometimes I say it's a waste of time because it's double effort. Yeah? I mean, why should I test something that is going to be changed right in the afternoon? So I'm, I'm just wasting my time. Sometimes it makes sense because in this more dynamic uh, software development life cycles, you really have to work together and in small iterations of work. And you know, we have experts here in Canva and, and Agile. They can tell that sometimes it's, it's just a good practice. And nowadays we talk about continuous deliveries, continuous uh, integration. Yeah, it's part of the process that the process is going in parallel. So it's, it should be fine if it's well organized. Yeah. Okay, last question. Hi. Hello. I'm Olga from Minsk, and I have a question about known issues as problem. I work as QA team lead on a large product, mm -hmm. and uh, from release to release, we have uh, more and more known issues uh, which are known to customers with which we release in release notes. It's like a demotivation for my QA team it members. Is. Yeah. yeah, and I have to proceed with it somehow. I provide this information to our product management. Uh, they agree that it's a problem, but do not solve it somehow. So my question is... How uh, to solve it? I don't know. It. <laughs> Come on. It's the customer that decides if he wants to invest money in solving issues. I see your lead. I've, I've been test manager. I can only inform the managers that these issues have to be solved. I cannot force them to invest money to solve them. So it's a decision point. If they don't want to uh, invest money in this, you've done your job. I, I understand that it's demotivating. I understand that. Uh, you know, part of the, being a, a test manager or test lead is uh, the political part. It's like discussion with management, this interfacing. Uh, that's a tricky part. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you have to explain your management that this bug count that I was talking, that is growing up, the known defects, it's, um, it's bad for, for market as well. Tell them that they're going to lose market, they're going to lose money. And this is probably a, a good point of uh, convincing them. Otherwise, if, if they hear that they lose money, they'll probably do something about that. <laughs> Okay. okay, thank, thank you, you guys. for your presentation. And now we have a lunch break. Enjoy and don't forget about the feedback. This is you have a likes. Green I'll be around uh, today and tomorrow. If you have more questions, you can come to me and yeah. talk. Yeah. Thank you.